I'm going to do my sponsor read thing real quick uh, because these sponsors have made this whole thing possible and we are super appreciative for them. Uh, so our diamond level sponsor is Warner Media. Gold level, we've got Kennesaw State University Coles College, their Department of Inf Information Systems also. Uh, Bishop Fox, Coal Fire, Genuine Parts Company, and NCR also at the gold level. At Crystal, we've got Chris Critical Path and Synopsis. Silver, we've got Aaron's, Binary Defense, Black Hills, Core Light, and GuidePoint Security. Bronze level, we've got NCC Group and our in-kind sponsors, EC Council for their online training and Secure Code Warrior for the virtual CTF. Uh, we'd also like to thank Crosshair Information Technology, Joe Gray, Offensive Security, and Pentester Labs for their contributions to the raffle prizes, which are really great. Uh, so make sure to hop into the raffle giveaways channel. Go chat with our sponsors in the sponsors channel. Uh, and yeah, just hang out. So next up for talks, uh, we have uh, Stefan Becker and Ryan Baisden. Uh, and they will be talking about serverless password cracking. Uh, so I will hand it over to them. Awesome. Thanks, Patrick. Let me... Uh... All right. So let me get this presentation slide up real quick. Yeah, it'd probably help. All right, is that full screen? We're good. Okay, great. All right, so introductions first. Uh, I'll start with myself and then I'll hand over to my project partner, Stefan. I'm Ryan Baisden. I work for a company called Risk360. We're a firm out of Roswell, Georgia that specializes in cyber risk, IT audit, penetration testing, compliance, privacy, the whole gamut. Um, my primary role there is managing and executing penetration test engagements and red team engagements. I've been doing this for about two years now on top of a, an IT security career from an internal perspective, organizationally. You can find me at my relatively new uh, Twitter account, at Sazosec, and uh, I'll let Stefan introduce himself. Yeah, I work for Epiuse Labs. We have offices here in Atlanta and all over the world. We help our customers um, create powerful and secure SAP landscapes with our software value-added solutions and managed services. Um, I lead up our AWS team, which just means that I, I help our teams uh, from a technical perspective, as well as managing our relationship with AWS globally. Cool. So without further ado, uh, I'll jump into our talk now. So this is serverless password cracking or how I learned to stop worrying and love AWS asterisk almost. Um, I hope there are some Dr. Strangelove fans watching. If, if so, you'll, you'll especially appreciate this. Um, if not, after this presentation, go and watch Dr. Strangelove. It's a fantastic movie. Um, so today we're gonna to be talking about password cracking, as you might've guessed by now. Um, and we're gonna be doing it all through AWS. So this could probably be done through whatever platform you like. I know AWS is not the only cloud infrastructure platform in the world. There's Google Cloud, there's Azure. Um, if you're in U Europe, there's some other options. Um, but it just so happens that my friend and local cloud, cloud expert, Stefan, specializes in AWS. Um, so first, we're gonna do a demo, primarily because one of my favorite talks ever at DEF CON 25 was about backdoors built into x86 processors. And he did the demo first, and I really appreciated that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut the screen share over to Stefan briefly, who has the demo set up. And what we're going to do is we're going to use AWS to, to crack a, an MD5 hash all from the command line. Awesome. This is my favorite part, live demos. Let's go. <laughs> um, cool. Can you see the right screen? Yep. Cool. All right. So we're going to do, we're going to execute a Python script Ryan and I wrote called Aries.py. Let me go ahead and give it a hash. So I'm just giving it an MD5 hash. We don't know what password this corresponds to yet. We're going to find out here pretty soon. Ah, oh, crap. That's exactly what I didn't want to happen. <laughs> 
One second. Great. So now what this script will do is first, it will send our hash onto a messaging queue. Um, in this case, we're using Amazon's SQS service. It'll then go out and create a P316XL, which is just a bunch of letters, which roughly equates to a server that has about 96 VP vCPUs and eight NVIDIA Tesla cards. Um, but then it waits. And on the server side, on boot, the server will execute a script that pulls our hash off of our message queue, puts that hash into a command, and executes hashcat. Once hashcat is finished, it'll upload the cracked password to an S3 bucket that our handy little script here is actually waiting for. Um, and our handy little script will download that cracked password. Upon completion, the server will kill itself. Meanwhile, um, I have, I've built in a couple of feedback items on the server side, because it's kind of a black box. So our server will also, upon creation, send us an email. It's not the best thing, but it will push a notification to Amazon Simple Notification Service that'll tell us once the instance is launched. And then once the instance has executed Hashcat successfully. We will also get a notification from S and S as soon as our cracked password is in S3. So now I'm going to hand it back to Ryan because this is probably going to take about five or so minutes. Yeah, this will take a minute. So so what I'll do is I'll I'll start going through um, some background on this project and I'll I'll let Stefan interject as soon as as soon as we've gotten our cracked password back. So let me swap screen shares here. All right. So a quick word on serverless. Um, we, we intended for this to be truly serverless in the sense that we could crack passwords with, without ever spinning up an EC2 instance. If there are any other AWS experts, engineers, architects watching this, you'll know that this is not technically serverless. When we initially came up with the idea, we thought, how great would it be to be able to do this without ever spinning up a server at all? As we moved through, we realized that wasn't necessarily possible um, in the form we were doing it. And I'll, we'll get into that a little bit later um, when we go through the progress of actually building this thing. So it's still technically used as an EC2 instance. Um, right now, there's no way that we know of elegantly to do hash cracking with Lambda. Um, but I will say, if there's anyone watching this who knows how to port Hashcat to Lambda or use OpenCL without a kernel, I will personally meet up with you, buy you a beer, and include you on this project. Um, the, what matters here is that relatively to the way people traditionally crack passwords, which is maybe using a big rack of GPUs or um, even just spinning up an AWS server for themselves and logging in, this is relatively serverless. Um, so why did we build this? The first reason is that we wanted to crack passwords. More specifically, I wanted to crack passwords because it's part of my job. And I wanted Stefan to want to help me do it in AWS because he's a guru with AWS and I'm a noob with AWS. Wow. Um, he did want to help me, obviously, which is good. Um, otherwise, this may not have happened in the form you see it today. The second reason is that racks of GPUs are insanely expensive. Back when I was trying to figure out how to do password cracking for RISC 360, we had the unfortunate experience of pricing GPU racks based on all of the people who were trying to mine Bitcoin during that bubble that we all observed and lost a bunch of money and were trying to get their money back. So in other words, it was a non-starter. Um, what else is expensive is AWS, if you forget to turn it off. These P3 instances, because they range anywhere from $20 to $25 per hour without spot pricing, can become pretty expensive. And if you go and crack a hash and forgets to turn it off, then you're looking at a pretty big bill. So we yeah, wanted a way- 20 grand a month, by the way. Yeah, it's a lot. We wanted a way to be able to do this without incurring any cost risk. So what we were doing before was one, cracking passwords with laptop hardware, which is not so bad if you have a pretty modern laptop that has the hardware that can handle it, but in a lot of cases, it's pretty slow and not everybody has access to that kind of hardware. So one of the problems we wanted to solve was how to let people crack passwords in an accessible way that they wouldn't have to spend tons of money, 15 to $2,000 on a laptop or even worse, 15 to 20K on a rack of GPUs. Um, 
And we were able to accomplish that by passing all of the computing power off to AWS. The second thing we started doing is we started spinning up very small P3 instances, less expensive P3 instances in AWS. We would crack the password over SSH after logging in, and then we would spin it back down, which again, all worked, but it required a lot of manual time and effort, which was another thing that we felt like we could avoid by doing some, some AWS maneuvering. We cracked it, Ryan. All right, well, let me, let me hand this back over to Stefan real quick so uh, we can see the final end of the demo. All right. Um, so here you can see my uh, notifications that I received. Um, we have our nice little Aries instance launched successfully message, or hash got executed successfully message, as well as our message that said the um, item is an S3. So I can show you here that, um, let's go do a quick results. Oh, <laughs> that's embarrassing. Um, here's our cracked hash. Uh, apparently this person uh, is a big fan of Panic at the Disco. I can't necessarily fault them for. <laughs> yeah, so that's so that's the end. That's the end result. Um, we're able to do this entirely from the command line. Now, there's a lot of setup in AWS that goes into this, but being able to send a hash on from a command line argument and get the results back in the command line was was our golden goal. We wanted to get to that for a lot of reasons. Um, when we were thinking about building this, I was taking into account a lot of the pen testing tools that I use on a regular basis and trying to figure out what the best components of them were. And I wanted to be able to implement that into what we were building. So the first thing that a lot of these tools do really well is use APIs. And when I say APIs, I definitely mean actual APIs, but I also mean that they get information that already exists or they use functionality that someone already built to do something new. The second thing they do is they don't really require giant installations. They don't require proprietary dependencies, lots of system requirements. They, they can be run with minimal setup so that they can be used quickly, get the results quickly in a usable format, and you're done. Side note, port your Python 2 to Golang. Um, this is kind of a joke because um, if you use pen test tools, you know that using Python tools ends up in a storm of dependency handling. And sometimes your virtual environments can break and it's just a nightmare. Golang kind of takes care of a lot of that stuff by being a compiled language. Um, so this is kind of a joke on Python. I still love Python, but Golang's great. The third thing is that they can be run from the command line. So there, this is not a hard and fast rule, just like any of these are not hard and fast rules. There are great tools like Burp Suite for web hacking, Zap, um, W3AF, all of these great utilities that are used for pen testing that don't run from the command line. But being able to run from the command line affords the person running the tool a lot of, a lot of capability and a lot of um, customization that is something I've come to appreciate with the tools that I use. So I wanted to implement that in ours as well. And what that came down to was Aries.py. Um, we, we built this, this tool and we named it after the Greek god Ares, the god of war, um, mostly for fun. Um, at Risk360, we, we do follow kind of a theme with Greek mythology. Um, so it seemed only fitting to, to name this Ares. And of course, because we're so thankful for Jeff Bezos and his AWS invention, we put his head on, on our Ares painting here. I mean, he might as well be a modern day Greek god of war, let's right. be honest. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Stefan talk about some of the cost savings because, again, we, we can talk all day about how easy this is to use and how, much, how low the overhead is. But when it comes down to it, one of the first problems we presented was how much it was costing us or potentially costing us to do this very simple job of password cracking. And we theoretically proposed that we'd be able to save a lot of money. But we weren't exactly sure how much until we finished. And I'll let Stefan go into that. Yeah, so the real, the, the magic behind this tool is twofold. One, um, this saves you time in provisioning a server manually. The script does all that for you. Um, you know, it keeps you, it even saves you time on like SSHing into the server. It's just a black box that you send things into. Um, the second thing is, 
we are using what's called AWS's spot pricing. Um, that's just a way for the customer to bid on AWS's excess capacity. Um, and practically speaking, what that means is instead of paying $24 an hour for this server, we're paying $7.44 for this server. Um, I did a quick calculation. Uh, in our demo, the server was only up and running for three minutes. Um, and effectively, that test run only cost us about 37 cents. Um, in our testing time, we used about 10 hours of server time and that equated to about what we affectionately like to refer to as 44 Bezos bucks. Um, and just for a quick currency conversion, you know, Bezos bucks is like a one to one ratio with a dollar, but it could have costed us about $240. I don't have $240. Ryan doesn't have $240. Um, it's, it's just insane. The kind of cost savings, that's about a 70% cost saving over uh, what's called on demand pricing. Um, so that's, that's my slide on cost savings. Yeah. What's, what's especially important to mention here about this, this picture we have on the right is that these vCPU hours aren't just cracking. In fact, they aren't even, um, as far as half of the time, actual password cracking. This was the entire time we spent doing password cracking tests, as well as just setting up the development environments, configuring the server to work the way we wanted it to, doing troubleshooting on our scripts. This was the length of our project as far as building this. So 70% um, savings on the entire project is not bad. The fact that it costs us $66.10 over the course of the entire project is still amazing, not even considering how much savings can, you, can, um, you can have once you actually run this tool and you're only cracking passwords. Like Stefan said, it's, it's cents on the dollar when it comes to cracking an individual hash. The server goes up and then it comes back down incurring no extra cost at all. So is this the best slash fastest slash most efficient way of doing this? Probably not. Um, for us, this was a classic hacker in a virtual garage solution to a problem. Um, but in my perspective, that's the true nature of hacking, uh, having a problem and solving it with the resources at your disposal. Um, those of you who have contributed to the open source community, uh, we'll sympathize with this. We have the same goal in mind building this tool as we did when contributing to open source, which is just do it. Uh, the chances are that somebody will likely come along after you and they'll do it better. They'll improve on what you did. They might even make you look like an amateur, but what matters is that you did it and you did it your way first. So the fulfillment of this project for us was finding this problem that we had and solving it in sometimes a quirky way, sometimes a uh, disappointing way as far as things we had to cut out that maybe fit with our original vision but weren't going to be functional. Um, so people probably are currently doing this better and people will probably do this better after, but um, we solved our problem and that's what matters to us. And so we learned a couple of pretty important lessons um, over the course of building this tool. Sometimes the coolest option isn't the best option. Um, in our initial iteration, you can call our alpha version, we had this ridiculous serverless orchestration layer where like a Lambda function was created that um, once uh, triggered would launch our P3 Excel instance and then it, we'd have another one that would have to wait and go find the instance and kill it. It just wasn't elegant. And um, we actually found out there were just a lot of points of failure. And so we just settled on scripting all of this out in Python using a very powerful library that AWS provides called Bodo3. Um, tool creation is a process. Um, we learned so many valuable lessons and uh, ultimately, you can build this ridiculous thing and find out that <laughs> Python is just powerful to handle the brunt of it. Um, in this case, we had, we realized that infrastructure of code and scripting is just better and faster. Um, for me as an AWS architect, um, I found that it fit the client requirements over what I wanted. It fit the client requirements better to just create a script that does all this for us. I mean, Ryan, would you say that this suits your needs better than some of the ridiculousness that we had uh, planned before? 
Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, like I mentioned in the last slide, there were elements that we had to cut out that we were, we were sort of married to. Um, but in the end, it became choosing functionality over choosing what we wanted it to be. And to meet our ultimate goal of an accessible way to do password cracking, we had to make some sacrifices. But in the end, the, the moment where we, we got it to run all the way through and we got a cracked password back was, it was all the reward that I think we needed. Mm. So what's next? First thing, more hash options. Um, if you were, if you're familiar with, with hashing algorithms, you probably noticed that the one that we passed through during the demo was an MD5 hash, which is notoriously common and also weak as far as hashing algorithms go. Um, during pen tests and red team engagements, we come across two much stronger types of hashes um, that are separated mostly into two families, the Windows family, so NTLM v2, Kerberos tickets, that sort of thing. And then if you land on any Unix-based system, you'll probably run across a SHA-256 or SHA-512 hash that you have to crack, which computationally are much more complicated than MD5. So bringing this to a point where there's even a more practical use is one of the things we want to do in the future. The second thing we want to do is enable brute forcing. This demo that we did runs through a word list, albeit a very big word list. Um, in fact, I combined the two biggest word lists I know of into one for this demo. Um, but word lists aren't always going to cut it. You'll come across a password hash at some point that is overly complicated and hasn't been breached before. So it's not in a word list. And the only way to do that is to brute force it. Um, we are doing some, some internal R&D on how to brute force more effectively. Uh, I'll keep that mostly secret for now because um, I definitely want to do a talk on it later. Um, the third thing, because I'm not a total hypocrite, is a Golang port. Um, I bashed Python earlier, not because I don't like Python, but because I actually love Python and I like to give it a hard time sometimes. But I would love one day to port this to Golang so that it's even, again, more accessible, um, easier to use, and can come in the form of something like a compiled binary. I know we have about a minute left, so I guess we could open this up for questions. I'll um, Slack for that. So I saw a question here that asked if the P3 is launched with an AMI or via user data. Um, so we did, we did end up creating an AMI for this. Um, we just found that, that it works much better. There were a couple of iterations where we did pass in user data um, but we ended up just, you know, landing on having a pre-configured AMI with the installed NVIDIA drivers um, and then including our server-side script in that AMI. I see any other Also, um, the other question that I see immediately from, from Christian. So can people use this today? Are we selling it as a proprietary open source? So we, we have no intention of selling this. Um, in fact, in line with our accessibility goal. I mean, we, we don't have it in a public repo now, but our goal is to eventually have this completely open source for anyone to use. They can uh, implement it into their own AWS environment. They can use our tool just like we did in the demo and we don't have control over it. We don't want control over it. I, I, have, um, I have a soft spot for the open source community. So this will be entirely open source. There was a follow-up to um, the previous question that I answered. Is the word list baked in or sourced from S3? Um, you know, I just realized it would actually probably be a great idea to have it in S3 so that, you know, from engagement to engagement, you can use a different word list. Um, and Ryan can speak on that more because <laughs> he actually does this in the field. But just to answer your qu question simply, it is baked into the AMI. Yeah, we, we put it into the AMI just for convenience for us. Um, it should probably be stored in S3. Um, the only, only thing I can see being problematic, and obviously you can write code to get around this, but having it stored in S3 and not in the AMI doesn't immediately give Hashcat something to latch onto um, and use as a command line argument. So getting it to, to, to fetch from S3 is totally possible and then running Hashcat but just putting it on the disk so it's already there was, um, was easier for us. And it's, it, as far as the word lists, again, like I said, it's, it's a combination of the two biggest word lists I know. 
and they're both public. One is the Rocku word list and one is the crack station word list. You can Google them both. I combined them and cleverly called it rockstation.txt. Um, you can do the exact same thing if you want to. Yes, the so, famous Rocku. <laughs> somebody asked just what was the total elapsed time. Um, we already mentioned this, but um, from the time we executed the script to password crack was five minutes uh, with about only three minutes of billable server time. And fun fact, AWS actually does per second billing for Linux instances. I don't know if they have that up and running yet for um, Windows based instances, but definitely uh, do for Linux. I do see a couple of people typing, so. Oh, thank you. All right. Um, if there are no more questions, Patrick, we can we can hand this. Oh, wait. Alex asks, is this concept also possible with Azure? And what made you go with AWS? I can answer the second part of that question. What made us go with AWS is one that we know that it's extensively documented and a lot of people use it. Um, the other reason is that, again, my my very good friend Stefan is an AWS expert. So it just it just made sense. Yeah, we don't, right, at this stage, our tool isn't portable between clouds. Um, this is AWS specific. How do we keep up with your work? So, um, so again, what I'll do, actually, let me, let me jump on to uh, my first slide here since I know yeah. I can't see it anymore. So we, we do have a we do have a private GitHub repo where we're working on this together. There are a couple of things that we would need to do before we can make it public. Um, and, and, and just some nice to haves like we this instance doesn't use any um, programmatic access keys on the instance itself. It's a big security no no. So what I what we end up using is AWS roles. And so as part of our GitHub repo before we go public with this, we'd want to make sure that um, like I'm working on a cloud formation template right now that'll go out and create that IAM role for you. Um, stuff like that. Also, um, you do need to make sure that you have the AWS CLI configured on your machine. And uh, we just want to create documentation about how to do that securely or just find good links on, on how to do that securely. So, Yeah, so definitely follow both of us on Twitter. I know I will be posting with updates to this project. I, I wish that the the repo was public today, but I promise that it, it will be at some point. Um, anything bites you with the serverless flow dying without results? Absolutely. So I know Constantly. that we, we had, so SQS <laughs> is, is a fickle being. Um, I know that we, we consistently had, we had to clear the queue, um, recheck the queue, re recheck the queue. Um, yeah. I wouldn't say that's SQS's fault. Sorry. I mean to, no, no, no. It, please tell me I'm wrong. You, you know so, better than me. <laughs> what, I don't know. For some reason in our testing, um, we did have some weird issues where when we were, we had a server up and we immediately pinged SQS. If the message just got there, the instance would struggle to get it. And so there does need to be some exception handling where the instance, like the script on the inst instance does like try and grab a message. And if it can't, it tries again. Um, we also had a, 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 an issue where because the script um, ex executed on boot, when we tried to go in and uh, fix our AMIs, the server would wake up and then die immediately because that's just part of the script is for the instance to terminate itself. So funny things like that happen. It's funny how like programming languages do exactly what you want them to or do exactly what you tell them to. Yeah. So, David says, you could take this one step further, collaborative cluster for cracking with a credit and queue system. Definitely. We more than once had to turn down the temptation of spinning up multiple instances and, and simultaneously sending perhaps, so spin up five instances with five hashes that we wanted to crack and send one to each. Um, I think if we had done that, we would have fallen into a black hole that 
wouldn't have allowed us to actually have a working demo today, but it's definitely something we thought about. We have, we have a, a pretty big vision for this moving forward. Yeah, and you know, the CLI command could easily be modified to launch five P3s or four, <laughs> according to your AWS account soft limits. Cool. Well, so we've we've posted our our links to Twitter uh, in the Track Protect channel for you to follow any updates on this. Also, um, you know, Stefan Stefan posts regularly about the work he does. I am going to begin posting regularly about the kind of work that I do, um, not just on this, but on other things. Again, like I said, I also do pen tests, so there's a wealth of information for me to share. Um, but yeah, follow us there, and uh, thanks. Thanks everybody for attending. We've yeah. enjoyed this and I hope you have too. Feel free to reach out to us on Twitter and even Slack while the conference is going on. Ryan and I would love to answer all of your questions if any more were to arise. Thanks yeah, guys. Yeah, we'll be here all day.